dear ambassador and the founder of this wonderful organization, your excellencies, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's a really great pleasure for me to be present today. It's something that I was thinking or planning for years was not happening and it happened today. And the question that uh, was raised to be discussed today is homeland and especially global security as the main theme of discussion is very important. It's important for many reasons. It's important for me because the way I see the world today that we are standing on the crossroad of a history of civilizations. It's a crossroad where the old paradigms, the old ways of looking or classical ways of looking at the human society or the classical ways of handling global risks or running the world are probably not effective enough. In my thoughts, I, I call it a new era, an era of quantum risks, an era of quantum securities, and an era of quantum politics. Quantum in this sense doesn't mean that I would like to use the quantum mechanics laws to the human uh, societies, no. Just an indication that the old ways of handling the world, handling security and handling the global risks probably no longer are going to be effective and we have to look for new creative solutions. In order to, to make it clear what I mean, let me simplify what I want to say, but that will, allow, that will force me to go back. Because in order to understand where we are and where we want to be tomorrow and where we'll be tomorrow, let's say in 5, 10, 15 years' time, we have to look back. And historically, in order to understand the 100 years of the future or 50 years of the future, we have to look back another 50, 100, 200 years to understand where we are heading. Mathematically, it means in order to continue the line of the development of the history, it's basically in mathematics pretty simple. You have to have the historic line and then continue it and you can make a prediction where we are going and where we are heading. And to simplify the whole story, let me take four activities of, human, of humans on this planet. Of course, again, it's simplification. I will take science, technology, human or human body, and I'll take the for the human society. I think it's not, it's obvious for everybody. The last two, 200 years, two centuries, we had tremendous achievements in science. And I'm, I'm speaking starting going back up to Isaac Newton and Maxwell, and then later in the 20th century, great scientists like Albert Einstein and creators of quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. It looked like their developments were, were done far advanced than the human behavior, far advanced the technology that was supporting their, their uh, discoveries. This was happening because the human activity of research and science is somehow connected to our human brain and I think has absolute freedom of acting and discovering the world without being attached to daily life. But it's obvious that their discoveries were connected to the industrial growth, to the new technology, the new industrial revolution and the changes in the society when the new capitalism appeared. The second one is industrial change, or we call it industrial revolutions. Go back to the 19th century, the 20th century. Of course, that industrial revolution was always a bit back, a bit late than the scientific research. In reality, today, what we see, what we are amazed starting and using, starting the flight of, of rockets, satellites, man going to the moon and dreaming to go to the Mars or having a global communication tool, which is our mobile phones. These are all products of scientific research, which was done not yesterday, but 100 years ago. I mean, the basic rules of quantum mechanics, statistical physics, biology, and so on and so forth. So it's very important to understand that what we call now revolutions, industrial revolutions, in reality, for me, they are not revolutions. They are just evolutions. But that evolutional curve is, was initially going slower, slower curved with a small angle that in then at the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st, that curve started dramatically going up. 
dramatically going up. You can call it exponential growth, but that's where we are. So if you take the first part of that curve, it needed 100 years to make a big difference in the lives of ordinary people. Then the next difference started in 50 years. And the next one, now we call it fourth industrial revolution. But at the end of the day, it's not a revolution. But in 25, 30 years time, we, we saw that our lives have changed so much, we call it revolution. In reality, it's just recognition of the rapid evolution. That is having tremendous effect on on us. The fourth curve of, or, or the fourth component of, of our behavior I would like to call human body. I, I will just bring you an example. An example that just a couple of weeks ago, a Nobel Prize was given to a couple of scientists, one from the United States, the other one from Japan, for their wonderful discovery, how to treat cancer. That's a result of 50 years of research of many scientists. But apparently they did the obvious thing, find a way that our immune system will recognize the cancer and fight it. And this is dramatic. This means, of, I mean, by increasing our immune system unbelievable heights, hundreds and thousands of times, we find a way of stopping the cancer and fighting it. That will have huge implications on the lifetime of human beings. In time, it will have human huge implications on also on the fourth line that I would like to speak shortly, which is the human society. I mean, if you go back, the science and industrial revolution had huge impact because that they gave the sort of the place to rep replace feudalism with the capitalism that was the engine of the growth of those times. But at the same time, a parallel process started, which was about more social justice equality, which we called Social and the world, going back another hundred years, started becoming divided into two polar societies. One was the capitalist one, one was the socialist uh, or the communist one. They coexisted until recently. With the fall of the Berlin Wall, it looked like the, the history has stopped. And there were some scientists, social scientists, historians, saying that that's the end of the history. Well, there is never an end of a history because, as in the nature, there's always laws of conservation. You cannot have a universe fi filled with only positively charged particles. You have to have the same amount of negatively charged particles. You cannot have a universe which is with specific matter only. That's why in order to keep this universe equilibrium, the scientists have created the idea of the dark matter, the matter that we have not discovered yet, but it should be there in order to keep the balance. So the key factor is not the end of the, or the victory of one system against the other. The key factor is stability, and stability and predictability. And of course, the new phenomena that is rising today from the side of the sort of other, other part, other side of, of the human behavior, which is more connected to social justice and equality, is connected to technology. It's the rise of a civil society. Individual vo voices of citizens have matter. That's why the whole world is becoming more and more quantum. Individual voices that could be basically exercised through the technological unit and have huge influence on the policies. A lot of us politicians are relying how many followers we have. 7,000, 70,000, 700,000, maybe 7 million. And we make use of it. So that's the quantum behavior of politics. Bypassing the traditional ways of going through television, newspapers, just addressing directly, directly to the public and making the public a part of the politics, a part of the policy making. Of course, all of that will be influenced by also new technological advances in our human body. Imagine in 50 years' time, people will live 150 years. What sort of problems, what sort of security threats or risk will, will, will that create in our new 21st century world? So I took only, I didn't take other paths of our behavior. I didn't take culture. I didn't take many others. But only four, science, technology, human body, and human society. What is clear today that the way we looked at the world 
the way we looked at the global risk, the way we looked at our security is going to be, we have to change ourselves. We cannot continue classically. Just a simple example. Let's take one of the risks, and I will make a comparison. Let's take an example from physics. Nuclear fusion, what does it mean? There is a nuclear body, let's say uranium or plutonium, that has enough mass. Enough mass in the sense that critical mass is ready for explosion. And then what you need there is only one particle with a huge energy coming and hitting that body. The moment it hits one atom, electrons are coming out. These electrons are hitting the other atom. The, the more electrons, more. It's a, like a snowball. It's called chain reaction. So what you needed? Two components. One is the critical mass, and the other one, a particle with huge energy. Let's take our new society, societies in the 21st century. Let me take an example, not a foreign country, but my own country. I'm coming from a country that after my inauguration, in two weeks we had a revolution against the former president and former prime minister that was elected as a prime minister. What is that we had there? We had a critical mass of people that were unhappy, that were unhappy what was happening because of corruption or injustice, so on, so on. So people's patients have come to a critical stage. And then you had an event that the prime minister or the former president put his, his candidacy for prime ministership. And that created individuals. And the current prime minister, who was leading the opposition, started the process. That pro process, for me, looked like a nuclear fusion. An idea, individual, or a group, or a political party with a lot of energy and and target, targeting the critical mass. And what does it create? A chain reaction, a revolution. Okay? That's a simplified version of what I'm trying to say. Another example is, is there. Look at global risks. Terrorism is a global risk, isn't it? How does it behave? Does it behave classically? Is it in a form of, of organization, groups, political groups, this or that? No. It is an idea, and that idea is worldwide. It's spread everywhere in the world. It's not necessarily the creator of the terrorist idea or the policy, and you cannot connect him to the final person who is <laughs> acting somewhere. The person, as we know, was in Afghanistan. The acts happened in New York. And you, did, you don't need to find a, a, a network and a change, because the idea negative idea, bad idea, with a, but with a force, can create a chain reaction. And how do you fight it? How do you fight the nuclear reaction? Do you take a hammer and start beating it? Can we send armies to stop terrorists worldwide? No. I think we have to change the environment. The nuclear body should be put in an environment that will absorb that negative energy. And the environment as a social organizations and political organizations have to find ways how to absorb the negative energy. Because with a hammer, you cannot resolve it. We have to find new ways of fighting terrorism. We have to find new ways of fighting pandemic. Because the pandemic is not, again, it's not classical. It will start in Hong Kong. The next victim will be in Argentina, not in neighboring China. Because we are a globalized world. But it's an also a new area of globalization, because globalization will not stop. Globalization had its phase one. And that phase one was run classically. Now, what is happening? The globalization is getting faster, but it's also supported with the rise of the civil society. So we have to find new ways of handling global security, global risks, and having new ideas how to run this world to make it, most importantly, stable and predictable. Because at the end of the day, these two factors and the risks are connected to each other. It's obvious. The more is predictability, i.e. in time stability, the less is the risk. The less is the predictability, the more is the risk. 
the more we can know where are we heading in a way that as humans we can understand, believe and control, the less is the risk. The more is unpredictable, the more our uncertainties in our world, the less secure we are and the risks are growing. And we are on the crossroad. We are on the crossroad of the history of humanity. The 21st century has not started in the year of 2000. The 21st century, the new century of global security, stability, new politics, the quantum behavior of our, of our societies, also risks, also security, is starting in 2020. We are at the gateway to the new world, and we have to start rethinking many of our values and approaches. And I think I should start, stop here. I'll be very happy if there'll be questions for me about Armenia. For me, Armenia is an example of a nation that lives in the 21st century. Why that? Because we are reflecting the tendencies in the world. It's a small state, but it's a global nation. There are as many Armenians living in Armenia as in Russia. Yerevan, the, one of the oldest cities in the world, 2,800 years old. There are as many Armenians living in Yerevan as in Los Angeles. So we are a global nation, so we are affected by what is happening in the world. In some senses, in IT sector, banking, new technologies, Armenia is a leader in the region. So being a president of a small state, I'm trying to be also a leader of the global nation. So that's why global things matter for Armenia, and I think it matters for the humanity. I stop here. Thank you very much.